and homicide are taking place at a rapid pace in the city of Philadelphia. The homicide detectives are working tirelessly to bring offenders to justice. Being a homicide detective is a hard job, and I am sure they are faced with many challenges and obstacles daily when they are trying to solve these cases. Joining me today is Inspector Anthony Washington from the Homicide Department and Lieutenant Norman Davenport from the Homicide Department. They will walk us through what homicide detectives are going through daily. Welcome to the show. Inspector Washington, we will begin with you. Please tell me about your background within the Philadelphia Police Department, and then Lieutenant Davenport will follow up with you. Okay, I've been uh, an employee of the Philadelphia Police Department for approximately 33 years, uh, 24 of which have been in patrol, basically from the ranks of uh, police officer, corporal, sergeant, lieutenant, captain, and inspector. Um, additionally, I have six years um, in narcotics, uh, working uh, with undercover officers doing narcotics investigations. And I have three with the uh, Detective Bureau, where I'm currently assigned, which deals with homicide and special investigations units, uh, such as major crimes, um, citywide vice, gun permits. And additionally, I have the six detective divisions that cover the entire city, Philadelphia. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, you know, it's so nice to uh, be on the call. Uh, uh, I have a 31 year uh, law enforcement career with Philadelphia. Uh, started with patrol in the 9th district in 1990. Uh, Upon uh, transfer from the 9th District, I went to the Bomb Disposal Unit for a few years uh, before getting promoted to the rank of sergeant. Um, I had my patrol duties as a supervisor in the 14th District. Uh, and then spent a little time in the Training Bureau working at the Firearms Training Unit. Um, I was promoted from there, went back to Northwest Detectives in the 14th District as lieutenant, and then uh, transferred to Northwest Detective Division. Uh, supervising investigations for the first time. That actually was my first stint uh, in the Detective Bureau. Um, I transferred from there and worked for a few years under uh, the then Deputy Commissioner of uh, Training and Support Services, uh, retired Deputy Commissioner Charlotte Council, uh, and it was from her office that I was transferred down to the Homicide Unit in November of 2007, and I'm currently still assigned to the Homicide Unit today. Okay. Now, both of you have extensive history with the Philadelphia Police Department. When you move into the homicide department, which you're in now, both of you, do you have to take different training or specialized training to be in the homicide unit? As managers, both of us are. Um, we don't per se uh, have to get any specific training because we're not hands on. We're not necessarily the assigned investigators for the investigations that we're assigned to. We're more so the guys that, or girls that's behind the scenes managing the investigations, looking at what the detectives are doing, uh, giving them oversight, giving them direction, giving them resources uh, that they need in order to bring the job in or to conclude it successfully, uh, finding out who the, uh, the perpetrators are. Yes, for me, I had a prior experience uh, with uh, Northwest detectives as lieutenant over a line squad up there. Uh, generally, supervisors who are transferred to the homicide unit, um, particularly sergeants and lieutenants, uh, particularly really have to have some form of investigative background uh, before transferring to the unit, because certainly when we talk about the investigation of a murder, uh, that certainly is the most complex uh, and generally most difficult investigation to oversee. So they prefer to have someone with some experience before being given to society. Okay. So over the years, both of you have over 30 years experience with the Philadelphia Police Department. Right now, we're dealing with some dark times in the city of Philadelphia. And crime has changed. It doesn't happen at night anymore. It's happening during the day, in the morning. What do you think, or what have you seen as to why these changes are, are taking place? And it always is so heartbreaking when you hear about that 12 year old who was going to the store and got shot in the chest. She's alive. It's not a homicide case, thank God. But 
what do you see that has changed over the years as to why the homicide rates are changing in the city of Philadelphia and why people are just, it just seems like there's no regard for human life and people are emptying clips on people. What change have you seen to, to make us get to this point? Well, I'll start by saying it's, it's many factors you have to look at. And I don't know if it's necessarily been a change or more so an increase in some of the crimes and the things that are contributing factors. Um, one of the things I know well, because I have the gun permits unit under my command, more and more people are carrying guns. The accessibility to guns is greater. More people are getting these guns for protection and more are apt to use their gun. Um, even sometimes when they get angry or they have a problem or a, a dispute with someone, instead of maybe handling things in the past where you would have had a verbal conf conversation or you would have maybe even had a fist fight, they are resorting to using their guns. Um, and then many times later, they look back and reflect and say, why did I use the gun? It wasn't necessary. Um, but you got you have that and you have social media beefing. Um, that's been a big uh, a big part of a lot of um, fights, disputes that lead to gunplay. People losing their lives from the youth up to adults. Um, and, and there's other things that I let Lieutenant uh, Davenport elaborate on, but it's it's a multitude of things. Yeah, some of the other factors uh, that we've seen, I'm not saying that it's a, a direct causal uh, impact, but certainly we see a correlation uh, with that. Even when we just look at just some of the cultural influences to violence in the city, um, you know, a lot of the gang activity that we see now involving our young people uh, seems to surround music or what is known as drill rap. Uh, and it's not uncommon to, to have the lyrics uh, of a song uh, really play out exactly what happened on the course of a homicide. Uh, in the videos, you see numerous youths uh, with handguns, with extended magazines, uh, even rapping about how they're going to stalk uh, and happen upon their victims. Uh, we had a homicide out in Southwest Philadelphia earlier this year uh, where the, the offender who eventually was arrested, uh, who happened to be 16 years of age, uh, actually went live uh, on an Instagram video after he shot four people, killing two of them as he's driving away from the scene. Uh, so certainly culture uh, has a lot to do uh, with where we are now as far as the violence uh, is concerned. And, and can't really say exactly how uh, this is playing out, but I can just speak for a number of, of officers that I have close relationships with. Uh, my son happens to be a three and a half uh, year officer in the 35th district working at night. Um, and, and he has expressed his frustrations uh, with feeling the lack of uh, support from the community, um, also feeling essentially the lack of safety and being able to perform his job uh, in that if anything goes wrong based on a split second decision, uh, not only could he lose his life, but also lose his freedom as well as his livelihood. And I think that, you know, sort of what we've been seeing over these past few years may uh, and, and, and very probably has impacted <clears throat> what an officer feels comfortable doing now, as opposed to what it was five or 10 years ago. And, yeah. and may just reduce enforcement uh, in, in many ways has also contributed uh, unknowingly to the violence that we're seeing right now. If I can add um, on to that, uh, Lieutenant Davenport makes a very valid point. The reforms that have been uh, going on in, in light of some of the social unrest, um, some of course are, are needed, but those of reforms have consequences that we have to deal with in terms of the reduced population as far as prison. Um, so a guy or girl that may be a gun defender that may have been um, on probation, parole, or arrested or, in, or incarcerated in the past may not necessarily be now. So that's some more opportunities for these people to, to engage in violence if given the opportunity to or to continue what it is that they enjoy doing, which is committing crimes and doing so with guns. Um, so that's some of the, the other things, too. It just seems like it's a strong indifference to incarceration now, and I understand why and how this has come about, but it is having an impact on the uh, on the community. Mm, okay, so as you know, I deal with victims and co-homicide survivors every day, all day, 
And for that mother and for that father, they all want their child's murder to be solved. Walk me through or break down for me. And I know you said that either one of you are not out actually out there doing the work at the time of a homicide. But break down for me. What happens when, when a homicide occurs in the city of Philadelphia? Tell me how your detectives jump into action. Kind of break it down just basically from the initial uh, reporting of the incident. Um, let me just say sometimes these incidents uh, are real time uh, with someone that's just been shot, stabbed. There's an incident of some sort and the police are called. Uh, sometimes we actually happen upon uh, the bodies of a victim where the crime may have occurred hours or days prior. Uh, patrol has uh, a, a duty um, to respond uh, and also secure the crime scene. It could be you know, inside of a residence, which is much easier. Uh, that sometimes we have crime scenes that have spanned over a distance of numerous city blocks. Uh, and that can be an extremely difficult undertaking to be able to secure the actual crime scene. Uh, the reason why the scene has to be secured, we well, need to see if all of the offenders are gone or all of them still present. Uh, you need to begin to start collecting all the physical evidence that you can in relation to that. Uh, um, certainly, uh, even understanding the victimology, uh, where was the victim? What were they doing? All that goes into play when it comes to moving forward uh, with the investigation itself. The majority of our shooting victims, uh, both those who turn out to be homicide victims as well as our non-fatal non shooting victims are usually transported to a local trauma center by the police. Um, so the police pretty much have almost taken on the role uh, of being lifesavers throughout the city. Um, part of that initial response also is to quickly identify our witnesses and, and do the best we can to talk them into coming to the homicide unit to provide a statement. Uh, we now ensure that witnesses are informed multiple times that their cooperation in a homicide investigation is totally voluntary. Um, certainly by far the most valuable tool that we have in investigations is video. Uh, looking for private video, which is primarily our number one source of video, which is found on rain cameras. Uh, sometimes we have uh, other videos found in local stores, uh, even some of our uh, posted city cameras uh, that are video in the areas as well. Um, our investigators have to respond, and we generally have these two investigators generally respond to the scene. Uh, one of them is responsible for what is what we would call charting out the crime scene, the block, which blocks are east and west of it which streets runs north and south of it, how are the vehicles parked on it? Because 20 years from now, uh, someone who picks up this report and read that scene uh, description should be able to visualize exactly what that scene looks like. Um, not just for the trial, which may take two years or more when the arrest is made, um, but even in the case of appeals, when a jury has to be able to replay what happened in their mind, it is so important for them to get a very good narrative of what that scene is, and investigators have the responsibility of detailing that, even dealing with lighting conditions, ambient temperature, and even the current weather uh, conditions. Um, we have a number of officers and investigators who have been trained uh, through the Federal Bureau of Investigations in uh, the extracting of video evidence. Not everyone has this training. So sometimes people say, well, we'll just get the cops to get the video. Well, it's just not that simple. Um, the, the video, the, the timestamp has to be recorded. If there's an offset of time, they have to know how to document that properly on the reports. Uh, it, it is a legal seizure. So, so we have to either get consent uh, from the owner of that video, or sometimes we have to get search warrants in order to obtain it. Most of the video we get through ring cameras, or through Comcast or other cloud or web-based systems, we have to use a search warrant and to request that video to be provided to us. Um, another thing that a lot of people overlook is we may download literally uh, terabytes and gigabytes worth of video. And these officers now have the task and duty of going back to review all of this video that's been recovered. Um, it's a number of things that happen even at our police headquarters, um, not just the interviewing of the witnesses or the reviewing of the video, but again, we talk about the analysis of mobile data, um, and mobile data usually is captured on phones. It wasn't until I got here uh, that I began to really just see the 
enormity of information and data that is contained on the phone. I mean, when you talk about where you've been, uh, your contacts, who you've spoken to, and things that we're not even aware of, you know, based on certain accounts that we may have and where we drive and if our Wi-Fi is open, so much information is available. So we have detectives who are assigned here, um, particularly with the victim's phone. Um, we need to get those plugged in right away. We need to get, get them in a, in a secure area so it can't be wiped away remotely so we can begin to extract that information from the phones. And then after you get have all that information, now it's time for the analysis. Sometimes we're able to identify a particular device um, that was at the scene of a crime. Now I say that because sometimes people think that, oh, they got the phone, they know who did it. Well, well no, that's not the way it works. We know based on the information gathered that this particular device was at the scene. Well, now the investigation has to continue to determine, okay, who has custody of that particular device. Um, and, and that kind of, you know, kind of gets us to where we need to be as far as being able to make an arrest. Now, just to kind of skip forward very quickly, after the investigation, now the court process is just as long. And that's different than what uh, the detective division uh, uh, investigator would deal with when you talk about having to put together the raw video and now put it almost into a movie form for a jury to see, to be able to lay out the physical evidence, even to the extent of putting clothing on mannequins to bring them into court, uh, to actually bring 3D models of the scene that our crime scene will put together so that a jury is able to see firsthand the scene and visualize what happened. The court presentation is crucial because unlike other investigations of crimes that occur in the city, our work isn't done here until there's been a clear identification of the offender, that offender has been arrested, and that offender is found guilty in court. Uh, and if there's any failings along those three lines, then really as a unit, we failed uh, to do our full job of bringing justice to the family uh, of that victim. Very extensive. And Inspector Washington, I know there are many people who co-homicide survivors that watch the criminal shows that are out here, the first 48, for example. In real life, it goes nothing like that, correct? Actually, the first 48 is a documentary that is actually true. And it is very accurate according to how we do things. Um, first, the, its name itself, the first 48 hours, is considered the most important time in gathering evidence, trying to find the, the killer or killers um, and trying to find out what happened. And that's why so much time and emphasis is put on that. But the other things concerning the collection of evidence, the interviewing of witnesses, the processing the scene as Lieutenant Davenport just thoroughly explained, all those things actually happen, but they happen over a period of time. In a perfect world, it'd be done in two days. But the reality is what you get shown on TV takes sometimes days, weeks, months, or even possibly years to culminate in a uh, successful arrest and prosecution. But, uh, but they really do do a, a very good job. In fact, the Philadelphia Police Department itself has been on that show in which they have gone through an investigation. So um, we, we look at that as definitely as being very accurate and up to date in the procedures used. Okay, so let's talk about those unsolved murders in the city of Philadelphia, especially for those family members where it's been a year, two years, three years. And I can imagine those family members are irate at times. And those detectives have to deal with that. How do your detectives deal with that mother and that father, grandmother, grandfather, guardian? Who is irate? And we understand why. How does your detectives handle those situations where they have to say, we have no leads. We have mm -hmm. nothing, no update regarding your child's murder. How does your detectives deal with that? I want to let Lieutenant Davenport get in depth, but to, to start off, I just want you to know, one of the things that we do recognize is that it's important for the detectives and the supervisors to be sympathetic to that family. Fortunately, from not only some training, but also from just people having empathy for others and the and everyone down there knowing the importance of, of handling these investigations in a proper manner. 
they're very kind and, and they're patient with the family uh, because it's a trying time. Uh, we've had detectives and supervisors that work there that have had unsolved murders of family members themselves. Um, and in addition to that, one of our officers that does an excellent job, um, Officer Ace Yes, Yes, she does. Yeah. Right. She is our victim uh, services officer, um, victim assistance, that is. And she does a great job of not only recommending the proper resources such as your um, such as your um, your company or the victim services that you do, but other people, too. And um, it's been very, very helpful. But Lieutenant Davenport would be able to elaborate on that a little bit more. Yeah, I, I can actually go back to the uh, to the tenure of our uh, uh, former uh, uh, retired police commissioner Charles Ramsey. Um, when he first came to Philadelphia, among some of the early complaints that he received uh, concerning homicides, because he certainly was very focused on uh, improving our homicide clearance rate, was the complaints about the lack of communication uh, with investigators, and, and he put me. Uh, responsible to start the next of kin meetings so where we invite the families in uh, to sit down with the investigators who will have the case file and then go over all of the facts uh, of the case up to the time of the meeting. And now, now, certainly, uh, initially, it wasn't too well received because uh, if you can imagine the anxiety or the disappointment of an investigator to sit down in front of a family that's broken and say, I wish I had good news for you, but I don't. You know, all of the leads that I have have run down, they've run cold, and nothing new is coming in. It's very frustrating. But what we found is by families generally understands that, but they need to be communicated with. They need to be spoken to with honesty and with respect. And generally, we're able uh, to kind of, you know, keep the lines of communication open. Um, and now, now one thing, you know, I will say, you know, before we move on to the next one, we understand that this whole process of being empathetic uh, to understanding that the family is not angry with the investigator, but they're just angry. Someone that they love has been taken away from them. Uh, we're really working to get the investigators to understand that because sometimes they don't and sometimes they take it personally, which we cannot afford to happen because now you start to have breakdown in communications between the investigators and the family, which ultimately is going to bring about a negative impact on the case. So we really try to keep those lines open as best we can for the sake of the investigation, but also professionalism and respect for the family who have suffered an unimaginable loss. Thank you so much. Real quick, what is the success rate for the, the homicide being solved in the city of Philadelphia? Currently it's 42%. Okay. All right. Now, so we're making progress. It's progress. It is. It's progress. So we're definitely going to have to have a part two. With this next question I'm about to ask, because we're getting ready to wrap up. Northwest Victim Services does a court with us court accompaniment with our victim. And it is very frightening. It is very alarming for a witness to have to come forth to testify in a homicide trial. And again, we spoke about how crime has changed. And it seems like there's no regard for human life. When you reach out to it, and we've talked about the court process, uh, Lieutenant Davenport, what security does witnesses have when you ask them, not you as in you, but you know what I mean, the homicide department, when you ask them to come and testify? That is so scary and it is so frightening. Are there relocation funds available for these victims? Or what do you do to ensure they'll be safe the moment they walk out of that courtroom? Okay, and, and that's a very good question. I'm glad you've asked it because I hope to maybe provide some clarity concerning this. And that's generally one of the witnesses who is a true witness first questions before they will even tell the investigator what happened. Will I have to go to court? And when we're honest to say, well, if you have firsthand factual information, it is very likely you will be asked to go to court. Some of them then say, well, I don't want to cooperate and leave. Um, it, it's terrifying. I mean, when you when you imagine someone who is in a community who has uh, witnessed a crime of someone's life being taken, it's a very real threat 
um, that people have to live with. Um, and, and now one thing I will say that in my time here in homicide, I'm going now on 14 years, uh, there's probably only maybe two cases uh, that I can recall in my whole time here where an actual witness uh, was, was murdered uh, because of their participation in the case. And in one of those cases, we know the witness was actually relocated to the state of Florida and flew back up to visit a, uh, not to visit, but for relatives funeral uh, and actually had almost contracted with uh, the individual that turned out to be their killer um, for protection. Um, so it doesn't really happen as often as people would think, but the threat of it is very real. There is uh, funds available through the Office of the District Attorney for relocation, but it is for relocation of witnesses only. Um, sometimes we have family members who feel, I'm afraid, you know, I would like to leave. And, and if they're in a position where uh, they happen to receive, you know, some type of subsidies or whatever for housing, we will work as a liaison to help get them relocated through those means. But the funding that is available for witness relocation is primarily for witness relocations only. And some people, when they factor it in, uh, and, and also it is temporary. So it's not a permanent establishment of residency. Um, they will provide maybe three months or so uh, of housing to get you set up in your new place, and then you have it, um, which is a challenge because for someone who may be living in a home that was passed down through a couple generations, you may not be paying rent, and now you're set up in a new home, but the continued rent is $1,200, which they may not be able to afford. Um, unfortunately, we may lose a witness simply because they don't have the financial means to be supportive after the case has dissolved and after they moved on. So that is certainly something that we need more support for, for witnesses. And also it's really unfair to have one person from the community stand up a case when we know that dozens of people were out there. Even if witnesses would have, and I know your agency does it, but other members of the community to say 20 people walk in, we are here, because we are standing for the victim. And then the witness gets up, but they're not there alone. That would make a difference. But generally after the initial response and the initial cries for justice, there is nothing more, but the witness is left alone to almost stand up for the entire justice of the community. That's just not fair. We have to do better with that. Thank you so much. As you know, I've been knowing Inspector Washington since I've been at Northwest Victim Services, which is seven years. And Lieutenant Davenport, I had the pleasure of meeting you probably about three or four years ago. I've been working with Officer Acevedo probably for about six or seven years. All of you do a dynamic job. I take my hat off to you. I think you are awesome. I know you work hard. And please know that you are in my thoughts and in my prayers every day. I advocate for you every day. And I speak your praise every day. And all of the captains, VAOs, and the community relations officers in the Northwest section of Philadelphia, all of you are doing a dynamic job. And I truly thank you. My condolences to all the mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, spouses, and family members who have lost a loved one to gun violence. Your walk through this life has definitely changed if you have lost a loved one to violence. I would like to extend peace and love to you. Peace and blessings. Mm -hmm.